Hello and welcome back, my friends and viewers, to a very long break for this week's episode of Legend Lore, where I draw and talk about monsters, characters, gods, and other things from a number of different tabletop RPGs, while giving a small but quickly digestible history about them. Together we go over their history within the game, how they're utilized in the modern edition, and how you guys can utilize them in your own games. This week, we're going to be taking a bit of a departure from 5th edition, not completely abandoning it for those who are a little worried about what's going on in the future. I just figured this would be a good time to expand my horizons, and so we're going to be covering Pathfinder 2nd edition, with our first video being about the goddess of justice and valor, Iomide. Interesting bit of trivia, Pathfinder is actually where I got my start in tabletop gaming, so it's interesting to be returning back to it. But getting right into it, Iomide's titles include The Inheritor, Light of the Sword, and The Lady of Valor carrying an alignment of lawful good and a portfolio that concerns honor, justice, rulership, and valor. Most Iomidean worshippers include paladins, knights, and warriors, all focused on protecting the innocent, conducting themselves with a valiant code, and smiting any evil that attempts to infest the world. Iomide's tenets boil down to be patient, fight for justice and honor, and hold valor in your heart. And on the opposite side, Iomide's anathema concerns abandoning a companion in need, dishonoring yourself, or refusing a challenge from an equal. Clerics of Iomide traditionally have to be of lawful good, neutral good, or lawful neutral alignment, and Iomide's domains in the second edition of Pathfinder are confidence, might, truth, zeal, and duty. Her favorite weapon is a longsword, her most common holy symbol is a sword placed over a blazing sun, her sacred animal is a lion, and her designated holy colors are red, white, and silver. If by chance you are playing a cleric to Yobade, the extra spells that you get from her include True Strike for first level spells, Enlarge for second level spells, and Fire Shield for fourth level spells. Yobade's divine ability score improvement can be either Strength or Constitution, her divine font for the purposes of healing or harming is Heal, and her divine skill proficiency is Intimidation, which is interesting when you think about it. Now getting into the lore and history, an interesting fact about Yomide is that she's one of the three gods within Pathfinder's lore that was originally a mortal, ascending to godhood upon succeeding on the test of the Starstone, a nearly impossible series of challenges that bestows those who succeed with a spark of divinity, but it really just serves as a great inspiration or excuse for level 20 adventurers to continue adventuring, especially those that want to become gods. Her life as a mortal before becoming a goddess include various great feats, such as leading the Knights of Ozum against the Lich known as the Whispering Tyrant, the forging of her divine artifact sword known as Heart's Edge, which was made from the shattered pieces of her original sword, mind you, and becoming the herald to the living god known as Eridan. Upon his death, she stepped up and took on his mantle, followers, and legacy, hence why she is known as the Inheritor and has one of the biggest followings in the entirety of Pathfinder. There is some possibly justifiable criticism of her piggybacking off of Erodin's considerable influence in order to grow her own sizable congregation, but one cannot deny that Iomide has some serious dedication, with the legendary 11 acts of Iomide serving as both her holy book and a personal record of miracles that she conducted before she even became a god. In terms of her appearance, Iomide is usually depicted as a female warrior wielding a longsword and kite shield, wearing full plate while surrounded by an aura of banishing light. The shield itself often either depicts her own holy symbol or that of her former master, Eridan, the symbol being an open eye surrounded by a pair of wings. When it comes to Iomide's relationship with other people or gods, notable worshippers and servants of the Inheritor include Queen Galfrey, leader of the Mendevian demon-slaying crusades and her most recently chosen herald, the Hand of the Inheritor, who was her formal herald before Galfrey ascended and was captured and tortured by the cult of the demon lord Baphomet, a sentient wheel of bright white metal surrounded by fire named Jing, which sounds similar to biblically accurate angels or thrones, Peace Through Vigilance, a young and cheerful celestial gold dragon whose spirit Yomide wishes to tend and maintain, and Saint Limeran, a former priestess turned celestial to Yomide who appears as a eagle-headed winged humanoid. Iomide is also credited with the creation of Eophanites, a servitor race of celestials that look like the flying metal wheels that I just described, serving the goddess as messengers during battle and carrying out her plans and strategies to her allies. In terms of Iomide's godly relationships, deities like Abadar, Caden Killian, Aristil, Sarenrae, Shaylin, and Torag are counted as friends that she can call upon. She does harbor suspicion for the goddess Phrasma due to her keeping the reason for Erodin's death secret. She also holds the ire of the god Irori due to his belief that anyone can achieve divinity through self-improvement, and that the use of an artifact like the Star Stone is simply the path of laziness. And I can imagine being called lazy would be a great insult to Iomide given all the things she's done. Beyond that, Iomide almost never associates with any evil deities or fiends, with the only exception being Asmodeus, whom she will cautiously sometimes seek the counsel of when rooting out traitors, spies, and manipulators of the law that she stands to protect. This can leave her open to the occasional manipulation by him, which can have its own set of disastrous, unforeseen results. 
Now, when it comes to the Church of Yamade, they are very reminiscent of standard crusaders, training and working tirelessly to uproot and destroy evil in its many forms. Many members of the church are involved in crusades to battle undead and feeds, such as the famous Mendev Crusades at the Abyssal Hellmouth, known as the World Wound, where they all hope to carry on Erodin's task of defeating the demon lord, Daskari. Within Pathfinder's campaign setting of Galarian, Yomade's worshippers can be found in the previously mentioned state of Mendev, as well as other places such as Absalom, Andorin, Galt, Lastwall, Molthun, Nimrathus, Numeria, and Sargava, with small, secretive congregations operating in places like Taldor or Cheliax. Additionally, the mistreatment of halflings within Golarion has resulted in many flocking to Yomade for protection and for justice. In terms of Yomade's teachings, many of them have been inspired by those of Aridin, but with a much stronger focus on progressivism and learning from the mistakes of history, rather than holding on to them out of pride. Most worshippers of the Inheritor seek to carry themselves with dignity and honor, focusing on the upholding of justice and the practice of swordcraft and swordplay. Incidentally, there is also a focus on the desire to bring civilization to those that they deem uncivilized, often headed by zealots obsessed with colonization and imposing their religion on others, rather than actually trying to help. Beyond that small sect, most young knights inspired by the stories of classical heroism or even Iomade's own acts often aspire to follow her teachings and remain optimistic even when faced with great evil. Their honor helps to outmatch the vices, sins, and darkness of people that they fight against, as Yomade isn't as forgiving or prone to redeeming evildoers like, say, Saren Ray is. Now when it comes to mechanical benefits, Yomade's obedience, which is a special form of prayer that offers those who engage in it boons, takes the form of a small wish of protection or guidance from her while holding your primary weapon with her holy symbol wrapped around it. It should be noted that you do not need to be a cleric or a champion to receive these benefits, as it may be up to roleplay or your dungeon master. But still, the success of this obedience offers the person a noticeable increase in diplomacy and knowledge of things pertaining to the noble classes, who oftentimes can be more evil than fiends themselves. Additionally, one seeking out her blessing may often be enchanted with magical cleanliness, with a person always being unmarked, armor always shining, and clothing always neat and unwrinkled. Further worship of Yomade and following her teachings can result in even more powerful boons, such as the removing of all negative effects and restoring of one's hit points, focus points, and spells to full strength. For those who have actively caught the Inheritor's attention and serve as her instrument on the mortal realm, she can imbue their longswords with the axiomatic, holy, and major striking empowerments, as well as a plus two status bonus to their weapon's attack rolls. This is when she is actively rooting for you to kill whatever it is you're fighting, and could be a great little surprise for a combat that isn't necessarily going the party's way, while also remaining interesting and dramatic. On the flip side, Iomade can curse those who carry her banner but do not conduct themselves accordingly. Such curses can manifest as your arms and armor having their hit points or armor class halved, not being able to receive bonuses to your attacks from things like flanking or attacking a prone enemy, or, in the worst case scenario, your weapon shatters upon striking the enemy, rejecting the selfishness in your heart. In terms of holidays related to Iomade, there is Ascendance Day, which commemorates the day that Iomade gained her spark of divinity from the Test of the Starstone, Inheritor's Ascendance, which celebrates the day Erodin chose Iomade as her herald, and some other offhand holidays such as First Crusader Day, Armas, and Remembrance Moon. These ones aren't monstrously developed, so you guys can add your own little twist or flavor to them if you want, and they can make great settings for a small adventure or a small quest. I should also remind you that Iomade's favorite animals include lions, eagles, and other symbols of leadership, as well as migratory birds, so be sure to use this when you want to give Iomade and worshippers pets or animal companions. Now, in terms of actual specific clerical orders for your players to join, the Church of Iomade is a massive entity that seems to encompass all aspects of her worship, with little need for separate, concentrated sects. The primary two orders in Pathfinder lore that emerge are the Knights of Ozum and the Order of the God Claw. The Knights of Ozum, or Ozum, depending on how you want to pronounce it, have also been recently been going by the name of the Knights of Lastwall. They are the primary military order that waged war against the powerful Lich Tar Bafon, also known as the Whispering Tyrant, and engaged in several other legendary crusades led by Ayomade herself when she was still human. Upon her ascension, the order decided to adopt her as their patron goddess, and are identified by the symbol of a blazing sword. Depending on the timeline that you're running your game, if you're running it in Paizo's campaign setting of Galarian, the Knights of Ozum can either be residing within Last Wall, or scattered to small splinter groups with the goal of retaking Last Wall from the clutches of Tarve Fawn. If you're running your own campaign setting, however, the Knights are a great placeholder order for your traditional demon-slaying, undead-cleansing, turn-and-burn group of heroes. Now, the Order of the God Claw, on the flip side, is an order that doesn't explicitly worship Yomade, but instead embodies the ideal of law and order and draws upon the aspects of various lawful gods. This includes not just Yomade, but the gods Asmodeus, Abadar, Irori, and Torag, and these aspects are collected and renamed the God Claw. 
a paragon of order which this group, often referred to as Hell Knights, holds up the most extreme teachings of. All this is to say that the Order of the Godclaw are zealots dedicated to the idea of order, civilization, control, and discipline, and will oppose their belief to a return of righteousness and lawfulness by intimidation and divine force. It is unknown if the God Claw gets its powers from these gods that they pseudo-worship, or if it is made by the power of their own conviction and belief, but the mystery adds to both the mystique and fear that the Order exudes, which is ultimately within their favor. As a Hell Knight Order, they are dedicated to enforcing the structure, control, obedience, and predictability that law and order provide society, allowing all to flourish and grow within the tenets of such constrained existence. I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but I guess that's kind of the point. When it comes to rituals or rites that the players can engage in or perform for a Yomide, meditative swordplay and sword dancing can be a wonderful expression of prayer and channeling of her divinity. The maintenance and cleaning of one's personal gear may also instill a sense of discipline and pride in one's good work, as well as actually forging and creating magical arms and armor in Yomide's name, whether it purely be for ceremony or for active use in her crusades. In terms of role-playing a Yomide at the table, should you ever decide to have her appear to your players, my recommendation based on her lore is to portray her as no-nonsense, respectful to royal positions or hierarchies, and stern but polite. When appearing to nobles or people of high station, she will refer to them by their titles and exchange proper contemporary niceties, especially given her being a mortal prior to ascending to godhood. This does not offer these people immunity to her scorn should they be undermining the things that she stands for. Corrupt nobles, demonic cultists, and overly vicious crusaders who have begun attacking the innocent are all equal targets for her wrath. And Yomade is very much a goddess who does not deal in half measures. She cares more about expunging evil and saving the good and innocent over trying to understand or even redeem said evil. It really is what separates her from the goddess Serenray, who has a stronger focus on healing and redemption when confronted with evil forces. Yomade is very much a hammer in comparison, with almost a zero tolerance policy for the malevolent and the truly villainous. On the flip side, Iyomide's intolerance of evil is matched by her willingness to fight against it directly. She is just as willing to march alongside her faithful against an army of demons as she is to comfort those who are suffering under the heels of oppression and manipulation. She is perfectly okay with doing her own work and is not afraid to get her hands dirty when it comes to battling fiends or any other malevolent creatures, exemplified during her constant crusades and leading of battles during her mortal life. As such, she will urge her faithful to stand as a bulwark between evil and those that it targets, and to let their courage and skill guide them in the defeat and destruction of their foes. In terms of my recommendations for how she interacts with other gods, I agree with most of them, but there is one point of contention that I personally have. As I said before, Pathfinder claims that Iomide takes a cautionary advisory role with Ismodius, but she has a very storied history of killing fiends and defending the weak and innocent. This presents a conundrum that allows for a variety of interpretations regarding her relationship with the Archdevil. She could see the usefulness in his guile and manipulation of the law in order to suss out traitors and manipulators in the courts of kingdoms. But wouldn't most of those people be beholden to someone like Asmodeus anyway? Why would he give up his own people even in the pursuit of a grander scheme? Also, wouldn't Abadar, the god of laws and civilization, be a better choice given his neutrality? From this, I personally suggest that out of all the gods and entities that Iomide interacts with, she hates Asmodeus the most. Beings of chaos like Rovagug are easily predictable and often defeated through brute force and a moderate amount of strategy. But people like Asmodeus, they are the hardest and the strongest of evils to remove, settling into the shadows and loopholes of society to rot it from the inside out, whilst undoing all of the hard work that gods such as Abadar, Erori, and Iomide herself do. That can elicit its own special type of hatred. And lastly, there's the idea of the immense pressure that Iomide deals with on a regular basis. Not having had to cultivate her own divine following entirely by itself due to inheriting Erodin's followers after his disappearance. While she has her own stories and legends to back her up, her literal title is the Inheritor. Most of her stories align with Erodin or feature her serving under him, and so she can grapple with both the idea of never having truly her own identity and the massive pressure that comes with carrying on Erodin's legacy, as well as discovering what had happened to him. All that is a lot for a mortal turned god to handle, so it could yield some interesting roleplay at the table. In terms of classes that can easily be aligned with Yomide, I will preface this by saying that any class can be a Yomide worshipper so long as they are roleplayed as following her tenets and keeping to her virtues. With that said, clerics and champions and fighters are the normal go-to classes for Yomide worshippers due to her status as a god and focus on martial practices. Barbarians of the Fury Instinct can channel divine rage towards righting wrongs and seeing justice done, as well as calling upon divine might to battle fiends in Yomide's name. Investigators can make excellent Iomide worshippers, opting out of the demon-slaying crusades in favor of sniffing out corruption within the systems of kingdoms in the realm. The summoners, despite their brokenness, can summon celestial-aligned Edelons and fight alongside them in the Inheritor's name, 
And lastly, for pure casters, Abjuration Wizards and Angelic Bloodline Sorcerers fit in very well with their protective and celestial natures. And Thaumaturges and Mages, or Magi, I'm not sure how to say that, with their mixture of swordplay and magic can make for excellent Yomadeans. Classes such as swashbucklers and rogues have a harder time keeping to Yomade's aspect of law, and witches and oracles explicitly gain their power from non-godly sources. Monks, due to their focus on martial arts over using actual weapons, and their often frequent following of gods like Arori, may come into conflict with the Yomade's tenants. Now, for Dungeon Masters, when it comes to creating quest hooks or NPCs for Yomade, here are a couple of things to lean into. Yomade's focus is on justice, honor, and the eradication of evil, not its redemption. Do not confuse her with Saren Ray. The Inheritor would have her clergy provide the party with quests having to do with the eradication of fiends and other evil entities who are causing the people to suffer, and finding demons is a classic fantasy tabletop trope that anybody could get behind. Her stance on the law being something sacred and meant to instill order and protection for society means that she would be keen to root out corruption and abuse whenever it manifests. Corrupt guards, greedy nobles, and other forms of societal degradation are met with a swift removal, as not all evil bears horns and red skin. In terms of NPCs you have aligned with Yomade, as I said before, most of her devotees would be champions, fighters, and clerics of her corresponding domains. War generals at the World Wound can hire the party to take on the Demon Scourge as mercenaries. Priests of Yomade can ask the party to collect rare materials such as Mithra or Adamantine to develop some new weapons in her name, and investigators can task the party in unearthing evidence to finally depose a corrupt noble. In terms of magic items that can be found in Yomadean locations, or given as reward slash loot from Yomadean NPCs, here are a couple that I personally suggest as the most fitting. Due to her status as a warrior goddess, armor, shields, and weapons probably make the best rewards, but that doesn't mean that she can't see the use in a magic cloak or a potion every now and then. All of this information can be found on the Archives of Nethys reference website, which is linked below in the description. And finally, for our homebrew magic item this evening, we have Inheritance, a plus two axiomatic holy longsword. Once per day, the wielder can use Inheritance to use the Smite Evil action, which is normally found on the champion's feat list. While this version of Smite Evil is active by the sword, you gain an amount of temporary HP equal to the Smite Evil's additional good damage, and creatures of evil alignment have a minus one penalty to all attack rolls against creatures that are not the wielder of the sword. I've included the item stat block in the description below, and with that, that's the Yomade the Inheritor, everyone. I want to thank all of you guys for watching and sticking with me through this new exploratory experiment, as I have been wanting to cover Pathfinder and other RPGs for a while and figured that this time was the best moment to kick it off. If you guys enjoyed the video, please like, share, comment, and subscribe, and also plus the little bell icon to be notified of future videos. If you guys want a chance to vote on future videos, check my channel's community tab to be notified of when the polls go up. And also, let me know how you guys have either DM'd for, or met, or dealt with Yomade as PCs, NPCs, or as Dungeon Masters. And also, let me know what you guys would like to see in upcoming videos. But until then, I'll see you guys next time.